everybody. Thank you for coming. Thanks for being here. Good. I see somebody connected online. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. I see that, that there were a few people online. So welcome to this side event on mainstreaming land rights of the rural poor in the climate change discourse. But this, this event is co-organized by the Global Forum on Agricultural Research and Innovation, G5. The Young Professionals Platform for Agricultural Research and Development, WIPAR. The, the Asian NGO Coalition for Land Reform and Rural Development, and the Land Portal Foundation. And we have speakers from these, these organizations here today. So the, I, I'm Valeria Pesce. I work for the Global Forum on Agricultural Research and Innovation, GIFA. I'm here with my colleague, Fernando, who's helping with everything. And thanks to him, we will have the presentations run smoothly. Oh, thank you. Well, I never, didn't hear anything so far. <laughs> thank you. So the topic that we chose, why? Because we know, and our partners that work on this topic know, that there is little awareness, or if there is awareness, it's not reflected in adequate policies about the link between land tenure rights and climate change, climate change disasters, resilience to climate change disasters, and also climate change adaptation and mitigation. So the idea about the, behind the collective action that GIFAR is running is that we work on raising awareness, we work on better documentation, and we work on involving rural communities and small scale, scale producers in policy making. Mm -hmm. This is the, the idea behind the collective action. And today we have speakers from two of the members of the collective action, the partners in the collective action, and we have a person from WIPAD here in person, Gishina Dlamini. Do you want to come to the stage? You are the only one who is present here today in person. Gishina, yes, please sit down, I sit with you. And we have two speakers online. We can show the names of the speakers. Uh, Fernando, you have, they had already shared. Okay. Next slide, the names of the speaker. So we have Natalia and Don Marquez from ANGOC, from the Asia NGO Coalition for Land Reform and Rural Development. And we have Romy Sato from the Land Portal Foundation. They will present from different points of view. And then the last one will be Giacina, who will give us the, the perspective of the youth. The two presenters online, Nathaniel, Nathaniel we speak most, mostly, let's say, from the angle of the civil society. They are an association of civil, civil society organizations. They work on land reform issues. They have done studies and analysis on this link in different countries in Asia. Romy will speak from the point of view of a network that works on making data and information about land as accessible, as open as possible. And Jishina, again, we speak about the youth. So I will give the floor to Nathaniel. Nathaniel, are you there? Yes. Fernando, yes. Fernando is going to run the, the, the presentation for you, and mm -hmm. you can tell him next, okay, for each slide. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to thank uh, the organizers uh, for inviting me to present our uh, initiative in this topic. I also would like to thank the participants for joining today. My apologies for not being able to join you physically due to challenges in applying for a visa. So next, please. My, my presentation will be based from the perspective of an each network of civil society organizations in Asia working on land rights, food security, sustainable agriculture, and participatory uh, governance. In terms of the flow of the presentation, I will provide a brief introduction on the video that Angok prepared on the link of tenure and climate change. And then I will conclude with some ideas for action to mainstream land rights in the climate change discourse. Next slide, please. Many of the world poorest who depend on land for their life and their livelihoods are found in the Asia, are found in Asia. Thus, land rights are central to reducing hunger and poverty in our region. At the same time, Asia is a region most prone to natural disasters, while, but while climate change affects everyone, those who are poor and lack land tenure rights are the most vulnerable to the direct effects of climate change. However, 
as what Valeria has said, there's still limited literature in understanding the links between land tenure and climate change. Much of the current literature focuses on the macro and physical impacts of climate change on land, with insufficient attention given to the social impacts of climate change from the perspective of poor people and how it affects their access to livelihoods, social relationships, and security of tenure on the land. Or in extreme case, statistics on deaths and destructions due to natural disasters are exposed by the media with little discussion on the underlying causes of the disasters. Thus, in 2020, Angok and our partners in seven countries in Asia prepared a discussion paper on this topic. Given the time constraints, we prepared an abridged version of the video to popularize the contents of the paper. The full paper and the full-length video can be found in our website. May I ask then the operator to play the video? The next slide. So next slide, please. Next slide, yeah. Okay. Well, okay, based on the study, we have outlined four key recommendations as way forward. First is to build a better understanding and appreciation of land tenure issues and climate change discussions. Second is the need for inclusive governance on the imperative to reframe the policy discuss discourse on climate change. Third is to address land tenure in natural disaster. And fourth, ensure an engaged stakeholder participation in the discourse of climate change. Next slide, please. In relation to the first recommendation that clim on the climate change discourse, next slide. Stakeholders should humanize climate change discussions. Focus on climate change as an issue of humanity in terms of lifestyle, consumption, behaviors, and inequalities, and the kinds of choices and sacrifices that societies will have to make. As such, using a human rights framework and lens, we will amplify the voices of the poor and marginalized and can help to bring focus on those who are disabled proportionately affected by climate change. Civil society organizations can facilitate platforms for communities to improve the, docu the documentation of field cases in support of public awareness and advocacy on the need to address land tenure in climate change responses. In, uh, in relation to the second recommendation, government should undertake a review of major national land laws on climate change and natural disasters on whether they explicitly address the links between climate change and disasters and tenure rights. As many governments include agriculture as a priority for adaptation within their nationally determined contributions, very few address issues of tenure security and land governance. Governments should include clear commitments that recognize and strengthen tenure of vulnerable communities to their nationally determined contributions and national adaptation plans. At the same time, policy should promote equal land rights for women and remove barriers to women's participation in sustainable land management. Indigenous peoples, on the other hand, should be legally recognized and protected to foster food security and sustainability of existing knowledge about land use, which can increase opportunities for adaptation and mitigation. In relation to the third recommendation, some possible areas for governments are to address tenure in climate prevention and preparedness programs and ensure that tenure concerns are addressed in relief and rehabilitation programs. Participatory disaster mapping for supporting and planning community-based disaster preparedness programs should be used and promoted. For post disaster uh, uh, <clears throat> for post disaster reconstruction, it is important to develop an inventory of potential relocation areas with assessments of their tenure and hazard risk. 
Finally, to ensure the participation of local stakeholders, there's a need to involve indigenous peoples and local communities, farmers, women, and the marginalized in the selection, evaluation, implementation, and monitoring of policy instruments for land-based climate change adaptation and mitigation. Mechanisms should be provided to provide to actively address land use that leads to land degradation and over-exploitation of land and water resources. It is important that land tenure issues be addressed in early efforts of building resilience and disaster preparedness. Thank you and good day to all. Thank you, Don. Thanks for introducing the topic and for showing, did you see the recommendations that come from this set of recommendations? And this introduces well the next presenter because we, based on these recommendations, we were looking for partners for the collective action and we identified a partner that works on, the, on raising awareness and on documenting, documenting cases, documenting stories. So the next presentation comes from the land portal and Romy is there. Romy, are you ready? Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay. The floor is, your, is yours. Thank you very much. Um, good uh, afternoon to everyone. I'm actually talking to you from Brazil today. Uh, so for me, it's still in the morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Romy. I work as the Knowledge Network Coordinator in the Land Portal. Um, you will see that the title of my presentation is slightly different from what you have seen in the uh, program of the side event, but still connected uh, very much to, to, I think, what you've received and, and the rest. So I'm going to talk about uh, the importance of data governance to enhance the land climate nexus. Next, please. So uh, I think one starting point for us is to consider what is data? No. And actually, um, if you think about it, I'll, everything basically is data. Um, the, the fact that we are here today talking to each other, it's being recorded, this will become a piece of data. Um, any documentations that you have in your computer, this is data. Pictures, um, Excel files, communications via telephone, so many things we are surrounded by data these days. And, and the question is, how do we manage this huge amount of data? I think more and more society is being uh, uh, confronted with these challenges, N not um, by coincidence, you have technologies like ChatGPT, like artificial intel intelligence coming to play. But are we ready for this reality? I think this is also another question that we are posing ourselves. And these amounts of data, um, can we make also the connections between all these data towards development goals? I think this is the, the framing, um, the context where Land Portal is working and trying to collaborate and um, to push for um, uh, land rights. Uh, next slide, please. And if you look particularly in the land sector, the situation that we have is we have actually probably too much information and yet too little. Too little, why? Um, so on one hand, it is a lot of information, but it is probably dispersed. Uh, it is too much, difficult to handle, but it often is also of poor quality. And very importantly, it's also often not accessible. What do I mean by this land data? Um, I mean different types of land data. I mean data about land administration issues, uh, about cadastres, about land use. There are different types of land data that I'm referring here to. And we also have to consider that in this space, data is power. Now, in our society these days, data is power. And that's not um, less significant for the land sector where land is also power to a lot of communities, is the basics, uh, the fundamentals of livelihoods of many communities. So uh, this is something we need to have in mind. Next slide, please. Um, and if you just go back a few slides, and a few clicks, just because uh, I wanted to show a few things first. I don't know if the animation is working. Next. 
Just one click. Uh, one more click, please. Okay, it's just coming like this. What I wanted to show just before in the previous um, frames that you see behind is actually that uh, the I did a few a quick search before this presentation, and um, if you click on climate data and particularly climate data that are open that are accessible, you actually find quite a lot of information as you can imagine. So very differently from the land sector, if you look at the climate change sector you have a lot of knowledge portals. I have found, I mean, you can download and scrutinize for yourself all the data from the IPCC reports. You have knowledge, you have um, disasters, climate disasters databases. You have uh, a knowledge portal on climate change from the World Bank. And all of these portals, many of them making data available, um, publications, statistical data sets, um, spatial also data and all of shape files all available for users to download and manipulate it um, and yet uh, I, I took a reference from this report from paris 21 report um, which talks about a climate change data ecosystem and it says the world now faces multiple challenges in developing managing sharing and, uh, and applying the full range of data needed to address climate, the climate crisis. Meanwhile, the data we do have is not fully leveraged. Some line ministers, for example, may not realize the importance of data that they manage in addressing the climate crisis and keep it only for internal use. So it's very much the same um, dilemma, the same uh, problem that we also have in the land sector. So this is uh, a situation on the land sector uh, we do feel we also have a lot of data, but it's also very disconnected and not well, it's a lot uh, of it is dispersed. And in the climate sector, you also have a, a similar situation with even more, I would say, data sets, given the, uh, the urgency to resolve the climate crisis, but again, not very well connected to probably the, the environment of the climate sector within the climate sector and within the climate sector with other sectors. Um, in development. Next slide, please. So this is what's driving our work. Um, this is a key sentence now for us that uh, summarizes our belief that data is of value when it is delivered into the hands of the right people in the right context. Um, so our understanding of data is very much this. If you put the most modern car or bicycle in the hands of a two-year-old um, child, it is not much of, uh, of value, right? And this is also our understanding. And so what is really driving our work is to develop uh, something we call the land data ecosystem. And why an ecosystem? If you think of an ecosystem, it's really you now this environment where the different elements are interconnected. Um, they have an impact. If you have one a, a difference uh, in that system and one party of that system, it also creates an impact in the whole ecosystem. And I think this is the ideal uh, that we want to reach. And it's really a data that is an ecosystem that all the ones contributing to data to this space is sharing also some common standards where all these parts can be more interoperable. Next slide, please. And here I start sharing a little bit of the work that we do on the land portal. Um, so we are trying to pro promote, uh, as Valeria was referring to, uh, openness, but also accessibility of the data. And with accessibility, I mean not only the legal and uh, um, technical characteristics that you need to, for data to become open. Um, and when I mean legal is, for example, issues with do we have the, the, the right to use and reproduce that data? Um, but I also mean accessibility in the sense of, uh, do, are we providing data information in a way that uh, the, the, a broad range of audiences can understand that type of data? So this is a particular uh, pillar of the Land Portal's work that I focus on, which is providing knowledge synthesis. We have, for example, uh, a range of country portfolios 
and in each describing the land governance situation in each country. And in each of these um, descriptions, we have a specific chapter that talks about uh, it, the issues between lands and climates, for example, to make this linkage. We also have what we call the thematic portfolios. So these ones are not focusing on geographic uh, geographies, but on themes that are cross-cutting with, with land, which in this one, I'm um, displaying a picture of the, our land and climate change portfolio. So these are only pieces that are trying to give an introduction to readers, to users of the land portal to start understanding these issues. Um, next slide, please. Uh, another part of this knowledge synthesis that we are doing is we are aggregating multiple types of data um, from various sources uh, with the idea in mind that if you want to know anything about land, uh, you can go to this uh, sort of one-stop uh, shop uh, where you can find publications, which we also consider data, which you find statistical data sets that relate to, to land and uh, some issues that are also cross-cutting. Um, next slide, please. And secondly, another pillar of the land portal is on the open data advocacy. Um, so it, just to come back to what do we mean by open data? Now, so here you have it's digital data. So it's not data that it's in paper now in your drawers. Uh, but it's digital data. So this is one important aspect that is made available with the technical and legal characteristics necessary for it to be freely used, reused, and redistributed by anyone, anytime, and anywhere. Um, this open data does not mean infringing with privacy. And this needs to be very clear now because we also operate in a space that it's important to keep privacy, of course, and particularly um, we are very open to debate also the, the uses uh, um, or the applications of open data. Um, and this is the what we try to do within this pillar of work, open data advocacy. We discuss some of these benefits as such as that increases efficiency, that increases transparency, that creates context to the data, that allows for challenging the data. If you make your data sets available, open for everyone to use and manipulate, you also have other people challenging the, um, that data, increasing the quality of that data. Um, but we know that for in, in land issues, some data, and, and there are situations in which you will put communities at risk. So this is something that we also have in mind. Next slide, please. Um, two other pieces of work. Romy, the open so, data. Yes, sorry, Romy. Please. Just if we can maybe wrap up in one or two slides because we started very late unfortunately we have another session after us yeah, yeah that's, that's fine I'm really no sorry worries. really sorry thank you no worries um i will put i will send these slides i think everyone can access these slides by the way you have some links to some of the work we are doing on open data advocacy uh, which is really creating an index as well of how open data in the land space is and you can move to the next slide, please. And here is just to quickly um, report that we are in this project together with NGOC and GFAR. It's a, it's a grant from GFAR uh, on mainstreaming land rights for the rural poor. I think it's the title also of this session uh, where Land Portal is trying to help with the knowledge synthesis, the, the knowledge creation um, uh, capacities that we have, as well as with helping to document following open data standards to particularly we believe that this is the way to create the to connect these two ecosystems the climate and the land community thank you very much thank you here. Romy thanks a lot so now we uh, let's say just to summarize very quickly and then ask a question to Gigina uh, the first presentation by Don was more on introducing the topic and also showing, uh, I mean, the recommendations that come out of their study. And among those recommendations, we have some that have to do with awareness, information, data documentation, and the land portal is addressing those. But we also have recommendations on involving local community more in having more participatory, uh, let's say, policy making. 
So after this two presentations, Gina, do you have any initial reactions? And then you tell us more uh, what you think in general. What do you think about the recommendations that Don proposed? And about this, uh, let's say, approach to making information more open regarding land. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, I think the presentations were, were, were good in terms of the recommendation to say uh, we need to involve uh, uh, the marginalized, especially rural poor. Uh, I think in the case of Africa, especially in the Kingdom of Swaziland, a lot of the land is in the hands of the marginalized. They have access to land. Uh, women uh, in the past used to not be able to get land but the system changed. Now they can be able to get land in the kingdom of Eswatini. Women can go and access uh, to have access to land. That is why we have a number of projects working with rural poor smallholder farmers funded by the likes of your IFAD, your EU. So the biggest challenge there is urbanization, especially to developing countries. A lot of the development that comes, that is where land is being uh, used anyhow. Uh, because when development comes and investors comes, there is to manipulate and ensure that they put their development anywhere, even on uh, wetlands, whereas land, uh, wetlands are so important in, in terms of trapping, uh, trapping your, your, your floods and ensuring that we, we do not have too much rains that will destroy and have a, a threat to our production. So urbanization is one of the biggest challenge. Uh, land is in access of uh, the marginalized, the poor. So um, I think uh, having free access to data is very important, is very key so that we know where is the land, who has uh, ownership to the land, who is doing what, so that we are able to even govern and see how we can best move because most of the land is lying fallow, is lying uh, uh, idly, so it can be utilized. So we need the data which is uh, free to access so that you can be able to uh, plan for for, for, the, uh, for for projects that will help youth, women, to ensure that you know where the, the, the land is. So data is, is important. It is called, like they've said, data is value when it is in the hands of the right people. So basically, we, 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 land portal is doing a lot of things. They need to uh, ensure they continue to doing the great work they are doing, Romy to ensure that we have a lot of data available so that data will help and inform projects and it will also help to inform in terms of formulating policies which are inclusive. Thank you, Gitina. But then from your point of view, I mean, being, a, a, I know that you want to give the, the perspective of the youth. Can you hear me with this one? No? Yeah. Okay. So, it, does it have a special angle for the youth? I mean, the problem of access to land and the policy making, do you think the policies are appropriate? Uh, I think when you understand young people quite very well, they are a little bit complicated. Young people are running away from uh, manual things. They don't want to play with the soil. They don't want to be in the land, the majority of them. So they're enjoying technology, vertical farming. So basically the few that are there, data will inform and help in terms of profiling young people who are in farming so that they are being linked to the land which is available there. But we have some good models in Africa, like in Tanzania, uh, they are doing quite very well to assist the young people to have access to land uh, by ensuring that those young people who want land, they can approach their government uh, to give them land and that land will be developed in terms of having education so that those young people who want to work, they are able to work. Even in South Africa, young people have access to government farms and support and funding to ensure that young people are working. So young people are a little bit complicated but because sometimes you'll want to give them land whereas they are not there. They want sophisticated technology, your vertical farming, your hydroponics. So that is where you'll find young people. They'll want to be on e-commerce and ensure that they don't get their, make their hands dirty. So if you want land, you need to be ready to be dead and play with the soil. So... <laughs> I didn't expect this answer. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Do you want to give a more I mean, broader, because you had a presentation, but you don't, you don't have slides, but you wanted to say something before we go ahead with the questions? Uh, I think what I can add from the presentation, number one, is just to anchor the importance of data 
uh, to say as young people, we really need working with YPAD, which is in, in different countries in Africa and even globally, to say we, 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 we tend to profile our young people, profiling its own prejudice data so that we know what young people are doing. And then from there, it will help to inform in terms of how can we link them, how can we support them. Our governments are willing to help and support uh, young people if they are available and willing to work. So it is that is very important to ensure that we have the data, the information to say what are young, young people doing. So in our case in the Kingdom of Eswatlin, we've tried to ensure that we organize young farmers through the uh, our uh, National Union of Farmers to say we lob it and say can we have a youth wing so that we are able to organize our young farmers by so doing we are trying to also inform that we profile those young farmers what are they doing and then we come in a collective voice to say we are coming to our government to say now young people are organized this is what they need our governments are so open if young people are organized and in the little space we are in the little land that we have do something so that they can see that we can support, we can give land rights or land access to those young people because it will not help to give access and land rights to people who live the land fallow and uh, it will tend to have some shrubs and uh, some invasive species. So we need to ensure that we entrust the land in the rights of the right people who will fully utilize it and improve. And so uh, careful in terms of the climate change, which is a real issue. So we need to be uh, able to mitigate and adapt to the change in climate as young people because it's real so that we use climate smart technologies, the conservation agriculture, your regenerative agriculture as young people. So it is the data that is going to help inform us where are young people, what are they doing? And then we recommend to our policies and our scientists who are in this uh, part of this uh, African agribusiness and science week. So, so in the end, this data should actually uh, consider the dimension of age in the end. It, that's important. It's not just access to land and the data about land ownership and land tenure, but also in terms of disaggregating by age and knowing which age groups. Yes, uh, yes, that's the, the age groups because um, uh, some studies have been done that the average year of a farmer in Africa is a, all people around 60 years. So the data will help inform to say, how do we motivate young people to ensure that they take up the, the farming space as a career? So by profiling, you will know, the information will tell you that now young people are interested in farming. So it will help profile the right kind of people. Thank you, thank you very much. So now you, you've heard our presenters. Anybody has a questions? I already saw Hildegard, yes. Thank you very much, Hildegard Lingnor from GFAR. GFAR. Uh, thank you for the great presentations we, we heard to all of you, uh, Don, uh, Romy, um, who else was on the screen? Um, and yeah, and voila, <laughs> and our speaker in the room. I would like to follow up on what you just said. So you have to have the data and you have to have it aggregated by age groups uh, in order to, to know whether young people are effectively uh, benefiting. What about gender? Uh, I have seen in my work across the world that it's uh, not only an issue about, um, and, uh, and it's getting worse in terms of um, uh, uh, young people not following up what used to be done by my and older generations, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's mainly an issue for women across the globe. Women often just don't have access, not even legally um, access. Uh, so uh, can we capture that as well in the data? And is there anything else? And if so, what that can be done? So not only we monitor what women, whether women have access to land and uh, yeah, and, and find out what, what's holding them back. Thank you. <laughs> Who wants to answer? Uh, I guess I guess both Gishina and Romy would want to. We want to start. Yes, uh, I think she is raising an important point that uh, women don't have access to land, whereas um, a lot of the smallholder farmers and the people who are in the rural areas are women, and they are the people who are contributing immensely in terms of food security. So ensuring that we support women to have access to land and have those land rights. It's a, it's a serious issue and it's, it is open for debate and it's very true. 
uh, that women don't have access to land, uh, ensuring that they, they are able to develop and they know that I own this kind of um, land. In our case, it used to be like that. Uh, we have a system of calling Wukonda. It was only allowed to men. And then, but it changed over time. Women now in our culture are able to go and have access to land and they can build their homes. They can do the farm in rural areas where the, 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 the poor are mostly located and they, they are able to do their production. But in majority in a lot of countries, still women are marginalized because of maybe religion, they cannot have access to land. Uh, maybe because of some policies by nature, whereas they are the ones. So something needs to be done. We need data so that it helps inform us that a majority of these women don't have access so that it helps inform and we lobby for women to have access because it will help in terms of our food security. Thank you. I, I guess also Romy will have some, something to say about disaggregated yeah. data on gender. Yeah, happy to answer that. Um, uh, what I see is that I think over the past 10 years or so, I think the gender um, and disaggregating data uh, according to sex is has is on the path to be consolidated. I'm talking about more at the global level, of course, of global data sets. Um, when you have, for example, the, the sustainable development goals, the target 1.4, which relates specifically to land, tenure security, and there it is already you know, disaggregated by gender. Um, this has been an important um, gain for the land community uh, that is already disaggregated by gender. It is not yet, uh, I think it is, um, it is disaggregated by age, but maybe only of adults. So there's, there's also still a gap there. I see an evolution that the same consolidation that we are seeing now for gender disaggregated data sets, uh, we might, from society, we might also see this development for disaggregation by age and to reflect the, uh, the importance of young people and to understand the dynamics of young people remaining uh, in the land or not remaining and how they may uh, still work in the land. But um, just to say that, that I, I think it's, we are still not I in the ideal scenario, of course, there are still many data sets that could be disaggregated by gender. Um, but there are, I, I have seen in the last 10 years, a growing effort to, to make sure that women is better represented in the data. And I think this is, is one thing also to talk about the global data sets, uh, but I think there is a huge importance, and this is where a lot of work still needs to be done, is more at the national level, at the local level. I think we need more and more these data sets that are looking in particular realities on, uh, on the ground to see how women is accessing and uh, land and the difficulties to that. And why is that? Because it's been particularly in Africa or in Asia as well, you have a lot of costumes now, you have traditions that are maybe very particular to, to some communities. And it is also very context dependent how women um, is accessing the uh, land. So I, I do feel that while on the global level, and you have, for example, something called the Stand for Her Land campaign, where major organizations around the globe um, are contributing to this. Um, at the national and local level, you have less so of such initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Romy. Maybe one last word to Don before we wrap up, because we have another meeting here after us. Don, do you have something to say about this? Yeah, I, I think one, one of the major cause of this uh, invisible, invisible data on women is that women, I mean, the, the tendency is to look at farming only those from the, I mean, the tilling activity that women are not, far, are not seen in the whole farming production processing cycle as in the same manner for ship, for fishermen uh, mostly statistics associate fishermen for males and not for women because it's mo the men are mostly those going to the sea but the processing of the fish marketing the whole cycle of, of, of that of, of agriculture involves women and because of that 
uh, also government data looks at the uh, at the household level. Basically, they associated to males, and hence women are are not being able to uh, access programs and support services offered by governments and other institutions because they are it's basically the head head of the households are being considered only for those ser services. In terms of the youth, there are many, I think there are many um, aspects that, that, that can be looked at. One is on the level of, of uh, advocacy and understanding and appreciation. The second is that uh, looking at the second generation issues of agriculture. And the third, uh, looking at the youth uh, as the new land rights workers and activists. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Now, we had planned a poll, but I don't think we will have time. And also, not, not additional questions, I'm afraid, because then, Karim, your, your session is going to start now. So sorry. Ah, 10 past. So we can maybe another question. Yeah. Yes, Ag uh, first, first Agnes, and then, yes, Agnes. Uh, mine is a short one. Thank you so much for the good presentation on this issue, but mine is a short one on the issue of land. Uh, maybe it is country specific or where already people are starting to acquire the right to land through titles and so on. And now we are getting new encroachment of very good uh, farmlands uh, due to the challenge of urbanization. So, that's a new challenge which is coming towards uh, uh, as we are facing or trying to handle the issue of uh, food uh, security or food and nutrition security. Uh, good land is being converted into urban centers and this is moving very rapidly. I think I can give a, a case in, in Kenya. Uh, all our neighboring counties to the city of Nairobi are literally converting into high rise. Mm. And that's a major thing. It is a discussion where are we going to start uh, kind of mapping the land and saying this land won't become, uh, you know, urban and remains farming. But then I have the title deed and I have a right to my land as to what I want to do. So we are moving from where people don't own land now we own it by right. I mean, we have the paper. And then again, we are doing things which are away uh, from the farming. And of course, it's more paying if you build up a high rise near uh, to take care of the large population in the urban area. So urbanization is encroaching big time on farmlands. And so as we deal with this land uh, data issue, I think we need to start looking at those pockets uh, in terms of our own food, food security uh, in our continent. Thank you yeah. so much. I, I'm sure our speakers have something to say about this. Yeah. I'm sure also the land portal. But... Yeah, yeah, she's starting, she's touching on a very important point. So we really need uh, a strong policies in terms of our urban areas. And, uh, we want to develop, development is key, but the good fertile soils shouldn't be used to build some towns uh, or houses because we will suffer in terms of food insecurity. It's a big threat. Uh, in a lot of African countries, it's happening uh, where we see land which was used for farming now being converted into some residential houses, some malls and all those things. Even in, 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 in Eswatin, it's happening. In a lot of African countries, it's happening. So we really need our policy makers to ensure that we protect the farming land and we maybe recommend those mountainous places where we maybe we cannot farm into residential um, uh, places. So we need, really need to play around with our urban policies so that we ensure that we protect that fertile good soils that could be feeding us. Even if you have that right, you have your, your tightly did, but if you can't um, use it for farming, why can't you lease it for someone to, to do the production other than building on it? So we really need strong policies to help protect those fertile soil. And some of the land uh, ha had some, um, some um, 
wetlands which are important people will just uh, build on top of those wetlands and they are normal which is rich biodiversity and indigenous knowledge that will need to be preserved thank you and i think rami uh, what is the situation because the land portal also monitors land use correct so that... um, to a certain extent, yes, correct. To a certain extent. So would mm -hmm. you have some data on this, I mean, uh, the use of land, urban areas and mm. fertile areas? Um, that, that's a good question. I believe we do, have, uh, we do have some data sets concerning, yes, and I think even that we are aggregating from the World Bank, um, urban and peri-urban areas, the extent, I think, territories and... Um, and I think even lands that are in areas uh, which are prone to, to climate risks. Um, what I feel is also that, um, again, I find that, that the importance of data in that discussion is key because uh, if governments are, for example, doing the zoning of uh, particular areas uh, in the peri-urban areas, um, that this information is also made freely available to the public so that the society can also jointly decide uh, or, or try to push and then participate for the decisions that what to be done with those areas. I think it's very important for society to know uh, the, the results of such assessments to understand what areas are prone for farming and what areas are not prone for farming. Because I think if we you put yourself also in the shoes of policymakers, it's challenging now because you do also have to manage the priorities of urban centers, of a growing population that needs housing. Uh, and this is also land issues, this is also important. Um, but you also need farming, you also need the space for that. So I think it's um, having as much information as possible, available and accessible is important for society to try to participate in, in such decisions as well. Thank you, Romy. Either we get another question or we get a final. Okay, you have, you have a question. Yes, we have a final question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Sidney Smelane from uh, Swatini. Um, in the past, it's, I think it's common knowledge that uh, women and uh, young people have been sort of marginalized in terms of uh, agricultural activities because they didn't have land. So there's been a lot of empathy, everybody trying to assist here and there. And as a result, there's been a mushrooming of um, non-governmental organizations, everybody trying to assist. And um, what I'm realizing is that even though they are collecting lots of information, um, somehow they're developing silos. Everybody's keeping information to themselves. So um, my question is simply that, what is the flexibility that we have amongst these institutions that are collecting the information in order to be able for us to, in order for us to be able to share that information? Because as long as if everybody's doing things on their own, then it will still take a, a, a long time to assist women and young people to develop. Thank you. I understand we don't have time. I, can I ask, answer for you, Romy, maybe saying that <laughs> one of the efforts of the land portal is to work on standardization, standardization of the data so that you can collect from, from silos, you go to aggregation and to standardization yes. and harmonization. So I guess that's one of the possible avenues. And maybe mm -hmm. I can put you in contact with Romy so she can answer, okay? <laughs> because I think we have to leave the room for another sure. meeting. Happy. Sorry. Thank you, Rami. Thank, thank you, everybody. You thank you, Don. Thank you, Rami. And thank you, Gicina. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And there is this uh, survey. I don't know if you had the time to click and complete the survey. Thank you. <laughs>